if we think about the reason why government imposes taxes in the first place is that government is trying to resource itself to mobilize resources to put to use from the private sector by imposing a tax on the private sector. And if then the government doesn't spend enough in order to mobilize those resources that it has made available through taxation, then you get unemployment. I think the government has a big role to mobilize resources in service to a particular cause. And now it can be about ensuring a future for children and ensuring that we don't have further energy crisis, that we can have clean air. There are very easy wins. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And today we are concluding our conversation about Stephanie Kelton's bestseller, The Deficit Myth. This is part seven. We hope you'll check out the other six, which I've linked to in the show notes for this episode. And today we're going to talk about the last two chapters of the book, because the penultimate chapter lays out various problems to be solved. And then the final chapter underscores how we can solve them. So we thought it'd be more satisfying to put them alongside each other as one conversation. So chapter seven is a riposte to the critics that mischaracterize MMT as the theory that says deficits don't matter by talking about the deficits that do matter. And it's entitled The Deficits That Matter. So in terms of setting the scene, Patricia, for the record, MMT is saying actually deficits do matter, just not in the way many people would intuitively think. So can you take it from there and maybe say what government deficits look like through the MMT lens? Yes. Just to recap, the main criticism is that MMT says deficits don't matter comes from MMT's assertion that there are no financial constraints to government spending. And critics, usually coming from the mainstream, effectively go, because the only way in which for them deficits matter is as a means to balance government budgets, then if MMT denies that role of deficits, then then deficits don't matter. And that's the conclusion they lead. But actually what MMT is saying is that deficits matter a lot. It's just not in the kind of balancing budgets and in a more mainstream way in which they are usually talked about. So if we think about the reason why government imposes taxes in the first place, as Warren Mosler and many others have said here in the podcast, is that government is trying to resource itself from the private sector, right? So it's trying to mobilize resources to put to use from the private sector by imposing a tax on the private sector. And if then the government doesn't spend enough in order to mobilize those resources that it has made available through taxation, then you get unemployment, right? So unemployment is always the insufficient spending or excessive taxation. It has an imbalance between both of those. And The issue is then that the government doesn't operate in isolation. There is also the private sector activity. And the private sector activity in terms of spending money, the private sector also creates money and spends it and creates demand in much the same way that the government sector does. But 
the private sector goes through periods of confidence and periods of lack of confidence or we go the business cycle, right? So the government isn't fully in control of the overall level of spending in the economy at any one time. So what the government can do is counteract the activity of the private sector in order to ensure that there's always sufficient spending in the economy for there to be full employment. So that means that sometimes the the government is going to need to run a deficit and sometimes the government will need to run a surplus. So deficits matter a lot because if you do not run deficits when you need them, then you create huge unemployment and poverty and everything that comes with that and recessions and it can contribute to big crises. So that's how two MMT deficits matter. And I think that's the way Stephanie's talking about them, unless I've missed something, Christian. No, that was beautifully put. And in a way, what you just said there was the government is laying on a tax, which creates the need for private sector to go out and earn the government's currency. And if the government doesn't spend enough, like you say, it results in unemployment. We can think of that as a jobs deficit, which is one of the deficits that matter, which we'll come to in a moment. But I wanted to just jump to right to today. So it's three years after Stephanie wrote this book. We can see an example of the deficit myth on full display. There's a headline in The Guardian this week, fast rising borrowing costs put UK finances at great risk. And that's a warning quote-unquote warning, coming from the government-instituted nominally independent fiscal watchdog, the Office for Budget Responsibility. And the article's accompanied by a picture of a shopper carrying a basket of goods, milk, bread, vegetables, etc. And there's a subheading that the national debt could exceed 300% of GDP within the next 50 years. So, it's classic old school debt fear mongering, getting you to think of a household going into debt to afford groceries when the article is actually about government debt. Patricia, why is that a false equivalence to draw? <laughs> well, I guess that comes back to the basic tenet of MMT, which is that the government isn't financially constrained. It spends money into existence after it has imposed a tax in, in that same currency. So I guess what usually annoys me about these kind of fear-mongering articles that they put in the UK every now and again, they completely ignore the fact that the interest rate is a government choice, is not set in the private sector. The UK government is effectively imposing on itself higher repayments towards the private sector. And the second is that Of course, that there is no, apart from other considerations in terms of what the spending itself on interest rate repayments is doing to the private sector, it doesn't mean that there is a shortage of money in government. The lack of money isn't the problem, but that this always frames it as if the government was a household, financially constrained the same way as a household. And therefore, if we have to save money, much like the shopper in the picture, (laughs) then so does the government. And that is the false equivalence that they usually draw from this. And this goes right back to Stephanie's first chapter in The Deficit Myth, don't think of a household. When you're thinking of government spending, don't think of a household. And just in case anybody's relatively new to MMT, it's we're not even saying that oh, the government can create new money if it needs to, but it would be better if it spent tax money. We're saying the government only spends one way by having its central bank credit the accounts by revising upwards reserve account balances. We've got a few episodes that I'll link to about those technical nuts and bolts about how the government spends. But the government only spends one way is the thing to bear in mind. So it's not the government should spend in this way or should create money. It's It does create new net financial assets, new purchasing power for the private sector when it spends. I was thinking maybe we should just outline, if you're able to do this, Patricia, the difference between the government deficit and government debt. The government deficit is simply is measured over a period of time and it's a flow and it's simply the difference between money that the government has spent and the money that the government has taxed back. That's all the deficit is. And the government debt is a stock 
And it's the accumulation of all past deficits. So the total value of all the money the government has spent minus the total value of all the money the government has taxed back so far. So in a way, you would expect government debt to increase. You would associate that with a growing economy over time. If government debt is net financial assets for the non-government, that's you and me, and overseas holders as well, but holders of pounds, safe assets. Well, you would associate that with a larger amount of net financial wealth in the private sector. Whether that actually results in recession or booms is to do with the behavior of the private sector. Yeah, yeah. And I guess overlaying this whole thing is that the point is these percentages, debt to GDP ratios, deficit numbers, in isolation, they tell you nothing about the health of the economy and they tell you nothing about what's going on on the ground. It's possible to be running a surplus, the government to be running a surplus and it's taking money out of the economy and it could go so far and you could go, yay, the government's in surplus and our government did do that. I think at the beginning of the year, after uh, everyone paid their taxes in January, there was a headline, hey, aren't we great? We're in surplus, we the government. And it's like, okay, what's the flip side of that? (laughs) So we're all in deficit then collectively. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really tell you anything. So that's the difference between government deficit and government debt. This Guardian article also brings up something you've talked about recently, Patricia, that the UK had the highest level of inflation-linked debt among G7 economies. Can you talk about why that makes a difference? There is a long history of the issuance of these bonds. And from what I hear, they've changed the original purpose, I think, at some point. But largely, they were to improve confidence of the private sector on holding government debt. And that in itself is questionable as to why you would need to do that. But the reason why this is a problem is what we're effectively saying is that the government is selling assets and then guaranteeing that those assets will not lose real value. And if this is... A lot of wealth, and I believe this a substantial proportion of the bonds issued by government, then it means that whoever holds these bonds, that part of their wealth, at least, is never going to be affected in real terms by inflation. Bonds in themselves that aren't inflation linked, you could say are risk-free in nominal terms, but these are risk-free in real terms. In real terms, yes. And this is putting the needs of creditors above the needs of debtors. I think if we want to talk in terms of the interests of creditors and debtors, you could see it that way. But whenever the government indexes something, the way I see it is that they are making their wealth of whatever group they're benefiting a priority over everything else. Uh, Sometimes inflation can be caused by a substantial decrease in supply of a particular good, for example, shortage of energy, which is what triggered, I guess, the last bout of recession. But even in those conditions, the government is saying, but whatever happens, half the country could be starving, but your wealth will not be affected. And I think that you have to be really careful when you do that and who is benefiting from that and why you're putting a particular group's interest above all the rest. So when the government pays interest, government's a net payer of interest to the non-government, again, that's you and me, we're included in that. So when interest rates go up, the government's paying more on interest. When inflation goes up, the government's paying more on interest on their inflation-linked bonds. What gets missed, and Warren Mosler, the founder of MMT, goes to lengths to keep underlining this, what gets missed is where does that money go? those interest payments. Yeah. They don't follow the money, do they? No, they focus entirely on the demand effects of interest rates in terms of the price of credit. And they consider that to be the dominant. I wouldn't even say they consider that to be the dominant thing. I don't think that repayment is even looked at (laughs) as a potential kind of source of demand. They completely ignore it. They're missing a bit part of it. Because if we're having articles saying public finances are so risky because the UK government is having to pay so much money in interest rates, well, then you have to question what effect that is having on demand, if that is true. If the quantity of money that's being repaid is so large, then why are we using interest rates to lower demand when it's actually increasing it? 
that should ring some alarm bells, I think, at the very least. And it may be that the make the composition of the UK debt is such that in balance, the demand falls when you raise interest. So it, it, that could be the case, but it is not clear. And I think it changes from country to country. And I think Warren repeatedly talks about the in the US being that when they increase interest rates, demand increase in, increases as opposed to decreases. Oh, demand's definitely strong as any mistakes are my own here <laughs> in interpretation of Warren. But, you know, he's saying, look, demand's strong. And I've got this idea about where it's coming from. And nobody seems to have another idea about where it's coming from. So I'm going with my story. And the interesting thing, actually, about our conversation with Warren was that when we discussed in the past about low interest rates increasing asset prices and being bad because of that and causing inequality, and then I think at some point in our discussion with Warren, he talks about prices of homes and things like that. And he says, well, if the rich are getting a lot of extra money through interest rate repayments, then they're going to want somewhere to put it. And that may in itself be pushing house prices up. So they never lose, really. So again, back to this article, the chair of the OVR is quoted as saying that the UK has experienced a succession of shocks that have pushed up government borrowing to its highest level since the mid-1940s. And that means the stock of government debt is at its highest level since the early 1960s. And the cost of servicing that debt is at its highest level since the early 1980s. But then he goes on to state, this spokesman from the Office for Budget Responsibility goes on to state, from this more vulnerable position, the government faces grave risks and pressures. And that's where the journalism ends. The article doesn't ask the question, what risks? What pressures? What are these vulnerabilities you are presenting as a fact, but not describing? What could he possibly be talking about? Is this the fear that people are not going to want government bonds because they fear that the government won't re be repaying them? All we've seen is the government repays their interest. They pay their bills. We've got no debt ceiling here. We've got no, not for want of trying, but we've got no Trump-esque person in office threatening to default on this, that, and the other. And I actually don't know what they could be talking about. I think it's pure reflex that, oh, you're talking about a debt and it being really high. The higher debt gets, the riskier it gets in terms of default. That can be the only thing they're saying. But as we said at the top of the show, and we say many times on the podcast, the government only spends one way. Any way that bill's not going to get paid is if they can't find somebody at the central bank with a finger, <laughs> a digit, <laughs> to key in the number, right? But that's the way they've spoken about Japan for decades, <laughs> and it hasn't yet happened. Oh, Japan's going to be terribly in trouble if they have to raise interest rates to fight inflation because their debt to GDP is so high. And it's like, yeah, they haven't got the inflation, have they? <laughs> Maybe these things are linked. I don't know. But anyway, obviously, the whole purpose of creating the OBR was to arm politicians who hate government spending on anything that isn't their salary <laughs> with some talking points. Sure enough, this article that we're talking about reports, a Treasury spokesperson said, this report reaffirms the need to be disciplined with the public finances. Additional borrowing right now would fuel inflation, push up mortgage rates and hike up debt interest repayments, diverting money away from our public services. So the logic is that the government can't spend more on public services now because that would push up government borrowing. That would mean more of the finite money the government has would be going to interest payments, leaving less for public services. What a pickle. <laughs> There's just one problem with the whole thing. It's like the money that the government spends, it's not finite. As Warren says, government neither has nor doesn't have any pounds. It's the scorekeeper for the pound. But that's an interesting statement from the Treasury spokesperson, because they said additional borrowing would fuel inflation. Are they thinking of the associated spending? that usually goes with government debt. Yeah, I think th they're using borrowing as a synonym for government spending, I guess. And so they're just like, oh, spending equals interest. Possibly they mean that, or maybe they mean the associated interest payments on the bonds they're going to issue because they're borrowing. There is another way they could do it. It's called overt monetary financing. They could spend the money without issuing the debt. That is possible, I think. I mean, if we call all government deficit borrowing, then 
additional borrowing wouldn't fuel inflation if the spending was directed at reducing inflation, surely. <laughs> but I understand they don't see things that way. <laughs> yeah. Hence the need for several hundred episodes of a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they'll listen to one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so just summing up then, the government deficits matter in this way. If you fix the deficit number, real world conditions will have to float around it. Whereas if you fix on a real world condition, like say full employment and let the deficit float around that, you can deliver the real world outcome. At the moment, because we fix on a deficit target and let the real world outcomes float, sometimes they float to recession, sometimes they float to a jobless recovery, they never float to full employment or price stability. So given the government as currency issuer has no choice but to fix on one of those two things being a real world condition or an accounting identity, <laughs> MMT, I would say, is asking us to consider which of those two things do you prefer? Because the government is the issuer of currency, it has to decide, is it going to fix on a real world outcome like full employment, or is it going to fix on an arbitrary deficit number like a ratio? There is no way around it. The issuer of the currency, the government will have to choose one or the other, right? That is exactly right. You need to know what your priority is going to be in spending. And you can have a lot of secondary priorities, but there is one that has to come above all the rest. And at the moment, that priority is balancing fiscal budgets without any kind of proof as to why that's necessary. And that not having any kind of real outcome in the economy, whereas our objective should be something tangible and real, which is employment and eliminated unemployment primarily. And so for people who prefer to still fixate on government deficits or just deficits as a concept, Stephanie's written this chapter and she writes that it struck her that one definition of a deficit is the difference between what we have and what we need. And so using the word deficit in that sense, she then goes on to identify real world deficits that are impacting us right now. And those are deficits in healthcare, education, infrastructure, breathable air, a climate that's not going to burn us alive. And because fixing those deficits will take human endeavor, a major part of fixing it all is fixing the good jobs deficit. Before we get to that, Fixing the healthcare deficit over here in the UK, Patricia, I would say would mean reversing those huge cuts to health and social services that were made under austerity policies of the conservative liberal Democrat coalition starting in 2010. I'll link to our episodes on MMT and healthcare, but right now in the UK at least, if we advocate spending for public purpose, we get inflation thrown at us, right? How can we address inflation concerns? I mean, you touched on it just there when you said, well, if the spending is targeted at reducing inflation, we won't get inflation or we'll be on a journey towards ameliorating inflation. So this is where I think MMT is extremely important. The main thing that I like about MMT is that it brings your attention to real resources as opposed to just financial figures that are quite abstract. So, for example, you mentioned about the spending on the NHS, reversing cuts, but it's not really about a number. So it's not really about saying if in the past uh, the X money was spent on the NHS and no longer is, then we should restore X money. It's not about the quantity of money. It's about the real outcomes and the real resources you have available to fulfill them. So if what we're saying is we're missing 5,000 nurses, we need to increase health outcomes by a, a certain amount or have specific targets and then describe what resources do we need to achieve that and do we have those resources available? Do we have people who would study nursing if we only provide them more support? Or do we need additional beds and do we have the means of producing these beds and increasing capacity in the healthcare? Those are the real outcomes that I wish we should discuss more instead of just saying, oh, I'm going to spend a billion more here without really telling us what that billion is meant to achieve. That's interesting because when whoever's in power, and I'm sure Labour will do this, and I'm sure they've done it in the past, and Conservatives do it as well, when they want to talk about what they've achieved, they've gone, spending on uh, healthcare has gone up by blah, 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 and they name a big number. People go, oh, that's big. And they don't talk about 
how many nurses they added, how many beds they added or anything like that. And critics of whoever's in power always talk about the real resources. Oh, this is how many beds we lost. This is how many nurses have left the service. This is how, you know, so you can always tell who's serious about the outcomes because they talk about the real stuff and you can tell who wants to dodge the outcomes because they talk about the nominal stuff. Or even other measures of real outcomes, like we could have a survey on public satisfaction with the NHS and measure government outcomes by how well that survey does. Waiting times is a good one, I think. And then we can say the government can set a target and say we want to reduce waiting times by this much. And we believe we can do that with this amount of money because this amount of money will go on these specific resources to achieve that. So that's all part of the process. If we just say, oh, we added a billion more in the NHS, but we spend it all on flower pots. It's not going to achieve much and you might actually cause inflation. In the flower pot sector, which is very sensitive right now. <laughs> yeah. But I think to go back to your point, what you spend on matters a lot. And so you have to understand where what is causing inflation. And some, not all inflation is bad. Some inflation may be a result of wages going up and workers may actually be getting better living conditions in real terms or better incomes in real terms, in which case inflation may not be so bad. If inflation is found to be a problem and people are being pushed into hardship because of it, then you may want to address it. And then you need to identify what is happening. Is this a result of bottlenecks in production? Is there a shortage of a systematically significant good or service like energy being probably the most systematically significant. And then you go, we have two choices, right? We have the common approach, which is, well, we just r reduce everybody's energy consumption in order to keep the price low by reducing demand that way. How do you achieve that without pushing people into further poverty, people who are not already struggling with high energy bills and things like that? The alternative, which is a much more productive alternative, is to say, well, how can we make up for this shortage? And part of the problem in the UK has been that we have lost a degree of energy sovereignty. So we need our energy security because after getting rid of the coal mines, they weren't really replaced with anything. There wasn't any mass investment in green energy, for example. And we were increasingly relying on exported energy because it was cheaper. But it turned out it isn't, right? And it would have been useful to secure more energy production at home. Well, the government could invest in projects that increase that capacity, supporting businesses who are already doing PVs, increasing the grid's capacity so that we can have more renewable sources of energy going into the grid and sharing energy that way. And sooner or later, they'll have to make those investments. So let's go sooner, shall we? But, you know, investment like that has a large potential to decrease prices by decreasing the price of energy, by making energy more plentisome, right? But it's not true to say that increasing government spending is only going to increase prices because they're only seeing the demand effect of the spending. They're not seeing the effect on the supply side, which is hugely important for inflation. Getting back to the book and this idea of a healthcare deficit. And the states, Warren Mosler's argued that government providing Medicare for all, which would be equivalent to instituting an American NHS, Warren said that Medicare for all would be deflationary in the first instance. Could you say why that is, Patricia? I think Warren's point on that is to say that, for example, the UK spends a lot less per capita on healthcare than the US does. And yet health out outcomes are generally better and the NHS is far more efficient at delivering it. So the fact that making healthcare public, or I guess Medicare for all is not entirely public, but it's a step in that direction. It makes outcomes more efficient and it means that collectively people have to spend less money in order to have a decent healthcare. Yeah, for instance, on sales. Yeah, sales, insurance, tons of admin work that you don't have when you have a, a public service. But yeah, everything that's associated with selling healthcare would take a big hit, wouldn't it? Like you've got graphic design firms, everybody around that. Yeah, marketing, all of that. And so it means that there'd be less spending on these areas and generally less spending. So if you have a policy that actually 
causes less spending, it's likely that you'll end up having to either reduce taxes or increase the spending elsewhere in order to not create inflation and for it not to create a recession as a result of it. So I think that's what Warren means. It's just in terms of efficiency and what that means for overall spending in the economy. I bring that up just because it's in the same category of what we've been talking about. When you see inflation, you want to pay attention to what the real root cause of that inflation is rather than going, okay, inflation equals too much money, too much spending, reduce spending, get rid of inflation. It's too blunt. And therefore, you're going to want to pay attention attention to where potential deflation might come from. And this is what Warren's saying, that there'll be a lot of surplus work being done when healthcare is, to some extent, publicly funded. And so there's potential for dangerous deflation there. But also, another way to say that is there's fiscal space opening up if there are things that need doing that the government would like to do. But I don't want to give the impression to listeners, and I know that we've discussed inflation in these terms a lot in the past in, as a kind of mechanical thing of too much demand or too little supply. And in reality, it's even more complicated than that, right? So, Christian, you must have heard conflict theory of inflation, this idea of competition between capital and labor, primarily capital and labor, of trying to maintain shares. And this is usually triggered by a supply side constraint, for example, energy shortage, energy companies see an opportunity to increase prices and to increase their share of the total output. And then workers may choose to respond to that by striking, demanding higher wages. And then you have a conflict initiating itself, right? And the government has a very strong role in acting as mediator in this conflict and deciding who is taking more of their share than they should and who isn't. And so taxation, if we talk about not just as a means of draining demand, but also as a means of punishing bad actors in terms of actors who want to take more of their share of the income than they should, it could be a weapon, right? Part of that to deter, for example, companies from seeking excessive profits. And that's a way of ensuring that they don't raise their prices, right? Because inflation ultimately is driven by real players in the economy, primarily firms, raising prices to either make up for an increased cost of wages or to simply increase their profit share, right? So all of this is going on, but that the government also has a role in doing that. And some of it may involve spending. Some of it may involve things like price controls, or some of it may involve taxation. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener. And we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. So just changing gears slightly in this chapter, there's a subheading, the climate deficit of the multiple real deficits that matter. One is the climate deficit. And I'll link to our episodes about MMT and greening the economy. But I'd say the problem isn't consciousness raising on this issue. Now, I would say it's a mainstream opinion that a green transition is necessary and urgent. What we need now is the off-ramp. And we know we can finance the construction of it. 
We know where to find the money. We know how to free up resources if they're not currently available as well in terms of taxation. So how do we build that off ramp as fast as possible, Patricia? I know your engineering work is in this area a little bit. So do you have any thoughts on this? Well, my engineering work was on built environment primarily, and built environment is a huge contributor to climate change. And I think first we need to acknowledge that the government can do something about it, because at the moment, I think we discussed it in the previous episode, that they always just try to make climate action profitable, right, as a means of encouraging the private sector to deploy solutions. And ignoring this idea that Dirk talked about last week that's in Stephanie Kelton's article, and it's something that Stephanie talks about, which is crowding in. It's like the government doesn't get in the way. The government, as Bidenomics has shown, when the government says, look, we're going to bring some manufacturing home and we're going to make chips here in the US, we're going to make batteries here in the US, the private sector goes, okay, I'll have a piece of that action. Yeah. So the narrative denies the government has any kind of active role in shaping the market or even on specific outputs. Both parties at the moment are in the UK, I would say they're very much, we need to enable the private sector to fix this. We need to, whatever, put a price on carbon. We need to use government intervention to just fix the market and let the market do the rest. Yeah, it works entirely on incentives, right? It's a bit like their approach to creating employment, which is say try absolutely everything except directly creating employment. (laughs) I think the government has a big role in mobilizing resources. We were talking about at the beginning of this podcast, the whole point of taxation was to mobilize resources when the government can certainly mobilize them in service to a particular cause. During the war, it was in service to winning the war and not being taken over by Germany. And now it can be about ensuring a future for children and ensuring that we don't have further energy crisis and that we can have clean air, that we can not worry about climate change that is already affecting so many people. And there are very easy wins. This is what is so annoying. There's so many easy wins. Something as simple as insulation for homes, which The sector has been banging on about for years and years, we need to not focus on new bills, but focus on the existing stock of housing and how we, because it's by far the largest of the two, and focus on how we make small improvements on it in order to achieve big gains, right, in terms of carbon reduction. But the problems have been deploying these things because the government doesn't take such a hard active role in making sure that there are enough people trained for it, making sure that things are monitored in order to be of a certain standard. And all these things require effort and planning and, oh, that word, central planning, right? (laughs) And I know people are going to start calling me Soviet, (laughs) but you know, you need to do that sometimes. And it's not something that the government should be shying away from, I think. So perhaps the supreme deficit that matters from which all the other deficits flow from is arguably what many people call, and Stephanie does in this book, the democracy deficit. The more money you've got, the more influence you have on policy. How can we fight this agenda-setting power that the very, very wealthiest have? We've always mentioned how democracy is key because we can talk about the economy as pulling levers and to get certain outcomes, but who is in control of these levers matters the most. And in service of whom are they are these levers pulled? And you cannot make sure that the economy is run in the benefit of the most people in this country without democracy, without simple kind of I guess, majoritarian democracy. And the issue is that there is a conflict, and I know a lot of people will know a lot more about this than I do, but there seems to be a conflict between the capitalist conception of money where one dollar or one pound equals one vote and the other conception of democracy, which is one person, one vote. So how do we keep the former under control in order to ensure that the latter prevails, right? That's a really big question. And But I guess in this podcast, we always talk along the lines of we have to limit the amount of financial votes, if you want to call them, that any one person or one entity has, because that puts democracy at risk for the rest of us. So limiting incomes and limiting wealth is not just a matter, 
of financial equality and unfairness, even though it is unfair, it is also a threat to democracy as a whole, right? Apologies to everybody that's heard me say it before, but I would quickly just say, Warren, Mosler has an idea that you could have a rule where you can give any amount you want to any political campaign, but you have to give 40% of it to the opposition so that you can only ever gain a sort of 10% advantage with whatever size of checkbook you've got. It makes sense to me. (laughs) And Tony Benn used to talk about the most revolutionary event in history being the masses getting the vote, right? The non-landed gentry getting the vote. That was the most disruptive thing that has happened in recent times. And I can add to that the women's votes as well. It brings accountability to those sectors of the economy. And we need to keep on working on what's the next step. How do we further those gains? What I like, and I'm sure we've said it many times on this podcast about MMT, obviously through taxes, you can impose taxes and make a rich person less rich. They're pretty good at finding loopholes though, right? But we could also fight the power of, or we can change the income distribution by making the rich irrelevant. We can always add money at the bottom. So we can always raise up the floor, which I think is something that we shouldn't gloss over. We might have to accept a higher rate of inflation, but it doesn't sound... Like an unreasonable thing to do. Yeah. If the floor is going up, then it might not be painful. It might be less painful. I don't know. That's a political question, but one that I guess the super wealthy have less weapons against. Yeah. Yeah. If you're looking at it from that way, right? Apart from that, they control a lot of the discourse because there's a lot of money at stake in in political messaging. I mean, they always do that. But I think that you're right in that their narrative is stronger when they try to deter people from actively penalizing them, as opposed to when they are trying to stop workers from being benefited. It's much harder for them to argue against the latter, right? This is a strategic talk. (laughs) Maybe the audience disagrees. I don't know. I bring it up because I think Stephanie in this chapter gets to the heart of a political messaging challenge when she writes, because these two chapters, these last two chapters of a deficit myth are really about, okay, so I've laid out what MMT says. These last two chapters are about me putting my experience and my personal views into what we could do with a MMT informed policy. So this political messaging challenge, I would say she surfaces it for me when she writes, my guess is what people really long for is a time when a single breadwinner could support a family, buy a home, put two cars in the garage, put the kids through college, take the family on holiday and retire with a decent pension. But it comes out as make America great again, or bring back manufacturing jobs. I was just thinking, how can we make that reasonable request, which is to be able to afford a decent standard of living, one that was affordable on a single income in times gone past, into a demand that's not make America great again or stop the boats. Yeah, that's the issue, hasn't it? That make America great again as a slogan is vague enough to really make you project whatever romanticized vision of the past you have of America. And if that is what Stephanie is saying, a time when the middle classes had a a better standard of living, that they could put their kids through college, have those kind of needs met, then of course people are right. We need more of that. But I think that's crucial that it was on a single income. Yeah, it was on a single income. And I'm sorry that women joined the workforce (laughs) and and it seems to have started a lot of problems. But I've said this many times in the podcast. So yeah, great. Okay. Now the workforce has doubled. That means we all need to work half as much, right? Well, that's what it should be, right? (laughs) Yeah. But it's been weaponized against workers. And of course, it's not women's fault. Women were absolutely right to want opportunities outside of the home. Oh, I'm glad you straightened that out. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Because you wouldn't think about that. (laughs) otherwise. But maybe what's happening now is quite similar to what happened then, right? So a good idea gets turned on itself. And now this idea of the past where you have a better, you can put your kids through college and have a a better standard of living as a middle class family in the US has been equated to we need to get rid of these foreigners. It's been weaponized against other minorities and other vulnerable groups. And that's where the problem comes in, because a demagogue will 
mix truth with lie and they'll identify things that are truly bothering people and I'll give them credit for that, but then present solutions that are completely the antithesis of what is actually needed. So yeah, in terms of solutions, in the last chapter, building an economy for the people, the major obstacle to building that people's economy, as Stephanie writes, is that in Congress, seemingly, and she's worked there, she says, there's only one way to talk about government finances if you want to be taken seriously. That is, taxes raise revenue for government, taxpayer money funds the government, borrowing drives the nation into debt and burdens our grandchildren. It's a big question, Patricia, but I think you can handle it. Why is all that talk about taxpayer money and stuff, to use a technical term, crap? Well, because it's playing into the main narrative, the, our current mainstream narrative, that in order for the government to do anything, it has to first start with collecting money or collecting revenue from the private sector. It's really disabling for a nation to think that because usually when the government needs to spend the most is when economic activity is at its lowest. And when economic activity is at its lowest, you also tend to have lower tax receipts. So if the government always acted, as we call it, prosyclically, so we behaved in the same way that the private sector does, then the economy would crash and we'd be in a downturn, like what happened in the Great Depression. That's exactly what happened in the Great Depression. And we have to understand that the government is not like a household. It doesn't have to start by taxing before it can spend. It, it actually sometimes needs to spend in order to increase the tax receipts from the private sector. And so while we're on this taxation topic, there's another editorial in The Guardian this week. Higher taxes on the rich are needed to fix broke Britannia. Now, to be fairer than they deserve, <laughs> this short piece just emphasizes that whoever comes into power next will need to ramp up government spending if they're going to fix everything. The Conservatives have underfunded and broken over the last 13 years. And there's just a paragraph at the end about taxes. And I'll just read it out. Without careful design, this spending will be inflationary. Government expenditure, it seems, can only increase in a non-inflationary way if fiscal space has been created by reducing private disposable income, ideally through higher taxes on the wealthiest, end quote. So it doesn't say we need the money of the rich to spend on fixing the economy, and it doesn't say that the government's run out of money. So it gets two points for that, but whoever wrote the headline framed it to mean exactly the opposite. <laughs> But anyway, the article does in a small way push back on the debt fear mongering from the Office of Budget Responsibility. Here's a quote, quote, in truth, it is the government that decides how far the interest paid on its debt should be determined by money markets, end quote. What do they mean by that, Patricia? Well, it means that the government sets the interest rate. It's as simple as that. But in terms of the yield curve, the government, the Bank of England's rate setting committee meet every six weeks, nine people, and they decide to raise or lower the base rate by 50 basis points, 25 basis points, whatever. But then there's the yield curve on government bonds, the two year, the five year, the 10 year. Again, that's a decision, isn't it? To let those prices go to market prices. That's a decision that the government have made here. And it's a decision the government in Japan have made a different way, for instance. Yeah. So the government isn't just, as you say, in control of the base rate. It's in control of the whole yield curve. And it has a number of ways of adjusting that. And as Japan has done. So yeah, I'm in complete agreement with the writer of this article. I just think that as you say, the headline and the content of the article is a little bit contradictory because it frames the need for higher taxes on the rich as a fiscal need. And even in the end, it talks about we need to make space by raising taxes, although they do talk about reducing demand as being the objective of those taxes, which is an improvement. Yeah, they're getting there, aren't they? They're very nearly there. And again, I do believe that the people that put the headlines out there, they aren't the same people as the people who write the body text, I think. I know unemployment rates are very low by mainstream standards in the UK at the moment, but I believe at least a million or more people still unemployed, actively looking for employment. And that's not to mention those who would work if they were offered 
a wage that are not working at the moment, who are not actively looking for a job, but who may be willing to work if the opportunity was given. And those people are really the key to solving issues on the supply side constraints, to assessing how much the government needs to invest and on what resources it has to mobilize. And that can go towards solving the inflation process, right? It doesn't have to necessarily start with taxation to reduce demand. We don't have to begin with the premise that Government spending can only increase demand, therefore we need taxation to decrease demand. It's simplification, but it's still better than the usual, we need money because otherwise the government is going to go broke. Yeah. So in terms of imagining future possibilities, in government budgets, there's a discretionary spending part and there's a non-discretionary spending part and generally the discretionary part is actually smaller than the non-discretionary part as i read it in the way stephanie describes it in the deficit myth and in terms of imagining future possibilities stephanie gets the reader to remember how the u.s put a man on the moon in the 1960s with mission-oriented government planning and although She doesn't pointedly say this in The Deficit Myth. I think it gets you to think, well, if a nation could do that in the 1960s with 1960s technology and know-how, what could we achieve today if government got behind the ball and worked on mission to mission? And I guess it's just a shame that the way our leaders feel they have to sell government planning is with militarism. So back then, in the 60s, it was fear of the Soviet Union, Today, it's the idea, oh, we're losing to China. Politicians need to feel the need to convince people that they're fending off a threat instead of saying, look, climate catastrophe, that's the threat. (laughs) Let's fight that. And mission-oriented. I know Stephanie Kelton uses that word. It's also Mariana Mazzucato's theme as well, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say that. I know that I think they're quite close and they know each other quite well. So it doesn't surprise me that Stephanie's using the language of her peer. But I think Mariana's work is very important for that. She's talking about how do you achieve real outcomes in the economy in terms of investment and technology and all these things. So she talks about private sector innovation doesn't happen on its own. It requires the government to do research, to do all this stuff. And that's extremely important. So especially for something like the moon landing is a good example of that, I think. I'd also wanted to flag up in this concluding chapter, Stephanie writes about how market incentives like tax credits for green investment can encourage the private sector to get involved, but still leaves them waiting for optimal conditions and that could slow down a green transition. And then in an illustration of the crowding in effect that we've been talking about this week and with Dirk Ends last week, she floats the idea of the federal government offering to buy high carbon emission generators from electric utilities to remove those costs from customer rates. Then she goes on to say that the US government could go further and increase funding for research and development and scale up deployment of energy storage technologies, which is not a million miles away from what Biden is doing with the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act. That feels positive to me. And she was writing, like I said before, in June of 2020. We hadn't even got rid of Trump at that point. So, you know, I think these ideas are having an impact now and they haven't fallen entirely on deaf ears. I guess the only point of contention might be to what extent do we want the private sector involved in benefiting from all these government contracts, all the new research the government would carry out. That It's effectively an approach to make certain development of technology profitable, right? It's a sort of subsidy. And that can work in certain areas. I just think that we need to have a discussion on what sectors of the economy do we want them to be on public hands and what sectors are we happy to leave it to the private sector? You know, do we want water in public hands? Do we want things like the internet and things that have become in recent times more essential than they used to be. And it's a discussion, you know, I'm not here to say that we definitely, everything needs to be on the public sector or everything needs to be in the private sector. I just think that it's not discussed enough whether the private sector is actually able to achieve the requirements for climate change or whether it might be better to put things in public hands and have them do it. I know that's maybe a bit controversial, but what's your view, Christian? 
Well, the penultimate chapter is called The Deficits That Matter, and it goes through a lot of, okay, this is the state of America today. There's a lot of poverty, there's crumbling infrastructure and all that. And we're going through the same experience largely here in the UK as well. But I was thinking the title of that chapter could just be Markets Don't Deliver Human Rights. (laughs) (laughs) They're not designed to deliver human rights. They're designed to deliver profits to people who are willing to risk their money. The onus never seems to fall on the defenders of privatization to explain, just like theoretically, in the case of like, say, water utilities, where can consumers go to buy better water provision service if they've had enough of Thames water? Or let's say I want to start my own artisanal water provision service and put the incompetent fat cat water services out of business by what mechanism does private sector market competition raise standards there's only one set of freaking pipes (laughs) you know what i mean like in all the commentary around the utilities, right? Nobody seems to be asking this question. Yeah. And I think there is a a misconception that markets provide you with your needs, right? Markets naturally provide you with what you need. And therefore, we shouldn't interfere with it too much. But markets don't care about what you need per se. The private sector doesn't care about what you need per se. The private sector cares about those needs, which is profitable for it to provide to you, right? It's not going to care about any other needs. And the only way to make it act upon a public need, make a private sector institution act upon a public need, is either the government by adjusting markets makes that provision profitable, either by subsidies or other types of support, or they get put in the public service. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They just direct it to act as it would if it were a public utility. Yeah. If we're going to go for the first option and the subsidies option, I think in some cases it can work, but we need to also think about what potential impact that has on the problem of inequality that we're already facing. How is that consistent with reducing inequality? I certainly don't want to be subsidizing companies that are already extremely profitable and who hold way too much power. Yeah, so I brought this up earlier, moving into the home straight, the jobs deficit. Now, let's talk about the MMT proposal to address the jobs deficit, which in macro terms is to institute better automatic stabilizers to the ones we use right now. Patricia, what do we mean by automatic stabilizers? Well, the automatic stabilizers is policies that are placed that are meant to react automatically to changing economic conditions. So unemployment benefit being one of them. So when unemployment rises, spending on unemployment benefits increases simply because more people are claiming them. And that happens without the government having to pass any new law or having to approve any further spending. As as I said before, this is part of the non-discretionary government spending. And then the job guarantee would be an extremely good automatic stabilizer because it would be aimed specifically at maintaining full employment. So those are extremely important. Those are your first line of defense, right? And then the discretionary spending is meant to address very specific problems that may change from depending on the circumstances and from time to time. And so you need to act with discretion, right, on how best to solve them. And that's a separate thing. What I like about it, the job guarantee, and I'll link to our job guarantee episodes. Some of them are from very early on as well. So we've got very elemental explanations of how it works and we've got more complicated ones later on as well. But, you know, that it is really what Patricia just said right now. If you become unemployed, you go into a pool of unemployed labor and under monetary policy, that pool is necessary to tame inflation. And we're saying at the very least, it doesn't have to be a pool of unemployed labor and it doesn't have to be a pool of people who are being paid less than you need to live on, (laughs) which there's just no reason for that. And people will move out of that pool quicker if they're working. And if they are working, they are going to be delivering services. And I think as Patricia puts it in her remarks about the job guarantee, that it should be designed to target 
local deficiencies, <laughs> things that aren't socially useful, things that aren't being delivered at the moment by the market, exactly as you're concerned about, Patricia, and me too. So, you know, that's why we like it. It's very much a no-brainer, I would say. I think we're at a point where it's obvious to some of us why there should be a job guarantee. And one day it'll be obvious to everyone else. And like, say, the NHS, people will just wonder how we spent years without it. But we're in this period now where making it a no-brainer, making it urgent to people is a challenge, I would say. So in terms of like a bullet point, or I hate to say elevator pitch because we're not on an elevator. We don't need to put ourselves on an elevator for this. But how would you go about making the case for a job guarantee to somebody who was open-minded but had limited time? I would probably begin by highlighting the way that we manage inflation right now, because that usually shocks people when they really understand it. And they are shocked that unemployment is basically used as a weapon or as a, a simply another tool in the arsenal to control inflation without regard for these people's livelihoods and basic needs, right? So we're throwing a number of people under the bus for the sake of others getting better prices. And that I think there's a good reason why it's not usually framed in that way, in such blunt terms, because it's once people do understand it, I think instinctively they reject it. They find it inhumane. And so very often I start with that. And then presenting the job guarantee as the alternative then becomes a lot easier. And to say, well, first things first, we make sure everybody has a job. But then we ensure that the spending required for providing people with employment varies according to the private sector's cycle. And that becomes a much more effective way of controlling inflation, but also results in a much more humane approach, right? Because at the moment, we, as I said, we're, people are being given the narrative that jobs are out there and whoever is unemployed just simply doesn't want to work. <laughs> right? Which is not what is happening and not what people understand once you teach them how monetary policy works and how the whole Phillips curve thing works. And so then framing it around, well, the fundamental right for work from a job guarantee perspective, which also has a very important technical role in maintaining price stability, then becomes a much more attractive proposition. What's your approach? Like you say, focus the attention on this is how we fight inflation now. <laughs> We use a pool of unemployed people. And if you've ever been one, or maybe you are one, it's not a good existence. And I think, in fact, in the book, Stephanie says, we're forcing people to play a game of musical chairs. We know the chairs aren't there. We know some people aren't going to be able to get to sit down. That's deliberate. That's our policy for managing inflation. And it makes no sense. We just don't have to do this. And so imagine what a community would be like. Imagine what a country would be like when all that economic insecurity goes away. So, yeah, I think that's the best jumping off point is the this is how we manage inflation at the moment. And what we're proposing is logically better than that. And then if another approach you could take is if you've told people the MMT money story that ends with, okay, so it's not revenue constrained. The government can spend whatever it likes on whatever it likes priced in its currency. Then the question should then become, okay, there can be negative consequences for any kind of spending. It all carries an inflation risk. And also private sector spending can as well. So the question then becomes, well, how do we get it just right? How do we make sure that there's just the right level of spending power in the economy? And the job guarantee delivers that. It makes sure that whatever's going on, whatever shocks have happened, that anybody that wants the means to feed themselves and house themselves can earn it. And it spends no more beyond that. <laughs> I think that makes sense. And obviously, there's all these other consequences that go with that. And it pretty much then means that every private sector employer to compete with that has to up their game in terms of standards, in terms of holidays, in terms of hours. And if you want to abolish crappy jobs, this is how you do it. If you look at UK headlines, and not just in the UK, but all over the world, it's easy to see how people are generally outraged at the idea that some people who are able to work may get benefits and they consider that unfair. 
I think that people are equally outraged to know that people are not even given the opportunity to work. So I think that we could do kind of an inverse of what has been going on to say, highlight how some people are really failed by the system in terms of not being able to even have the opportunity to prove themselves as active members of the economy and to have a job. And of course, that leads to a lot of personal and societal problems, crime or drug addiction and other things that are very costly, not just in human terms, but also in terms of resource terms. So all those things, I think people's empathy can be weaponized in that way. And one thing I would just underscore as well is I'm a big advocate of treating different people differently, which is something that you can do as a person pitching an idea to another person. And I think sometimes people see media content, blog posts, whatever, about, say, MMT, who are MMT fans who go, oh, you said that wrong, or yeah, you should emphasize this and not emphasize that. And it's like, look, whenever we say, look, this is how I'm pitching the job guarantee, for instance, in this time and place, we're not saying this is the one size fits all pitch. <laughs> we're saying that this is how I would talk about it, given who I was talking to at the time. There are many other ways to pitch the job guarantee. There are many other ways to tell the MMT money story, not in terms of substance, but in terms of tone, there are other ways to say it. And so to anybody that's like, well, I wish they'd talked about this, or I wish they'd said it in that way. It's like, well, you can do that. That's the great thing about it. It's about what you're going to take away from this. And that kind of fits with the way Stephanie ends the book, which is to round off with these words, from her former boss, Bernie Sanders, who always says that change never comes from the top down. It always comes from the bottom up. And Stephanie then goes on to write, if we're going to take advantage of the policy space that MMT opens up, it's going to be because enough of us, readers like you, help to shift the public debate in a new direction. It's our future, it's our economy, and it's our monetary system. We can make it work for us. So, from me and Patricia, I'd like to say thanks for listening and spreading the word about MMT. In the show notes for this episode, I've linked to where you can find out more about some upcoming live events, including the third International European MMT Conference, which takes place in Berlin on the 9th and 10th of September. And that features MMT founder Warren Mosler and primary MMT academic L. Randall Ray, along with MMTers such as Nathan Tanker, Stephen Hale, Nodongo Sambasilla, Yan Lang, and many more. Me and Patricia will be there. We hope you can make it. For our UK listeners, there's going to be an event in London on the 1st of September featuring Warren Mosler. Tickets aren't on sale yet, so I'll link to where you can sign up to the GIMS mailing list for updates about that. For our Australian listeners, there are two Rethinking Capitalism weekends coming up in Sydney and Canberra in July and August, respectively. Finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all our patron-only episodes, including one with Dr. Sam Levy about economics in the movies and edited audio highlights of the book launch of the 2023 anthology, MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers. Check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for the time you put into understanding MMT. And we look forward to seeing you next time on the MMT Podcast. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at MMT podcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. 